guys. No promises this time about what will and won't be saved on this podcast. Kind of a lot like Dr. Oz in that way. Um, I saw this, this article that his um, chief of research for, is refusing to say that he did not do research on puppies and that no puppies were harmed in the making of his products. That's right, guys. You can vote for Dr. Oz if you want to. I know most people can't, but here in Northeastern Pennsylvania, we get that option. And here's the thing. You can vote for puppy murder if you want. That's your choice. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, like, on a typical basis, I stay out of this shit. So yeah, I know it's I'm politics gonna stay bro. out of it. <laughs> well, here's the thing: I um stuck my dick in a little bit, got caught. Figured I might as well go all the way. Hey, might as well finish, finish. You know what I'm saying? What's up, John? How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what to say after all that. <laughs> Puppy murder, full penetration. Yeah, it's all we call that the. Way. The full Dr. Oz. He's gotta, he's gotta grab your nuts sometimes, give him a tug, and dip him in that sweet iced tea, baby. Hey, it's funny. What, what, what? That was a perfect intro to the story that I had written down for Dave. <laughs> oh, great. Good. Nuts in the iced tea. I don't know how that could be the perfect intro for anything, so let's hear it. Well, I gotta know. It was more the, the pull the nuts portion. Okay. So, so Dave and me are best buds, but we have we've had a few moments in our life, and uh, I grew up as Dave always pointed out. I was the the, the scrawny one, um, and Dave was not the scrawny one. So you know, uh, get in a fight with your brother, and you got days, to be desperate. And um, sometimes you do what you got to do. So yeah, one time Dave got a full <laughs> handful. I damn near ripped the nuts off. <laughs> Held on to them for long enough to put them in a position where when I ran away, I actually had a chance to get away. And then Man. I just counted on my speed. So, yeah, it was a random wow. story. I just figured I'd, I'd share that a little too I personal. wish that was the only time someone grabbed and tugged my nuts really, really hard. But I have three kids, so I think I'm solid, man. <laughs> All right, man. That's a wrap. <laughs> we don't got anything else to say. There's a ball grabbing. Cut that out. <laughs> no, no. Nothing's getting cut out. No promises other than it's all on. Bro, seriously, man. This is, this is great because... Obviously, this is a, a basketball podcast that, you know, three brothers get on here. It's going to be about balls no matter what. That's for damn sure. For Dude, damn sure. As long as they're loose and we're picking them up. Put them in your pocket. <laughs> Go back home. I don't usually keep mine loose, but, you know, that's your thing. Bro, <laughs> I haven't worn underwear in, like, four years. <laughs> it is the best decision I've ever made, man. Yep. I think I it's, may have given you the advice to do that back when yeah, I was in you know, Rico. When, guys, yeah, you know, yeah, when I moved to Hawaii. Let's just change the subject because while we can all agree here that we don't like underwear, we don't need to make this whole podcast about how we've all sworn off underwear. That could be another podcast. Well, no, no, no. For John time. John has that fancy colorful underwear now. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Here we go, guys. <laughs> let's talk about the Thunder. We got four wins in a row after losing our first three games, and the vultures yes. were circling. People were like, ah, ah, this is it. And we're like, hey, we got some fight left in us. And we've seen the team stand up now two games in a row, double-digit fourth quarter, quarter comebacks. And, man, even though there wasn't there wasn't a packed house at, at Paycom, man, those fans gave the team a much-deserved standing ovation. Man, I'm pumped up about it. That's why we're going to show you guys all of – the made baskets from the Thunder, all the block shots, all of the um, the steals, everything that made this game so fucking awesome, man. It was one of those beautiful games where you get to see a team bend but don't break, stick with it, and find your best brand of basketball. But, mm. man, Shea, all hell, Shea, Gilgis, Alexander, bro. Ooh. What what a crazy game, man. Like, seriously, like, there he was getting less minutes than he's gotten all season as far as being out there. Right. And he really made up for that in the fourth quarter and that, in that last seven minutes, right. When they made the last substitution out seven and a half minutes, whatever it was, uh, Shea comes out, uh, comes into the game. Josh Giddy comes out, Dort comes in, you know, there's a switch that these guys have and not every player has it. Not every player has that ability to take it up one level. And that's exactly what Shea and Dort did for us last night. It was truly spectacular. Just watching it. I, I was like looking at it. 11.7 minutes. That's not, that lead is not large. You know, but bam, bam, bam. 
Next thing you know is we flipped the lead, you know, and it was we were we won by eight. But it was spectacular how it happened because our defense stepped up. Our offense stepped up. We took shots that we're supposed to. Shea got to the lane. Like, these are the things that we need to see in closeouts to know that this team is for real. And now we've seen it in four games. And it's it's crazy, man. Crazy. Wild to me, wild to, me to see um, the pace that was set, though, pre-Shea coming back. Um, and he mentioned it in his post game, but like, honestly, the, the rest of the team set the pace, um, for him to return to the defense was going, J rod was kicking, everybody was moving, everybody was getting everything going and Shea came back in. And when the rest of the offense is moving like that, Shea's weapons are 10 times more powerful. Especially when you have tall people, man, they had a lot of tall guys. We pushed that pace with that, that, that second unit, that whatever second unit for you know a good five minutes and then we switched it out and by then it was just like these other guys they, they couldn't get their their legs underneath them when yeah. you have big bodies that's a problem you have john yeah it brings I, you, you down I, a few inches when you're moving yeah no doubt i know you don't have a big body yet you know i know i know you're still like under 175 pounds or whatever but <laughs> dude like it's all reach. good man you'll get there one day you'll look like me one day in like 80. <laughs> so what do you guys think about? Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought I was, I was going to change the subject. No, no, there was nothing that actually needed to be said there. <laughs> all right. So what do you guys think about J-Dub getting the start tonight? I love it. All right. John? Summed up. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I, I think that he he's earned it, but I think that – He's earned it to some extent. Obviously, he's only played a few games, and they're still trying to figure out where people fit and how to do the rotations. But I think with his consistent ability to have a positive impact in the game, um, it makes sense to be giving him starts here. Like, I don't think anything's going to be that consistent this year, other than Shea being a god. Um, I think the rest of our, our team and what and the results and how they're going to play each game is going to be um, trial and error. I mean, NBA is about matchups. Um, so J Dub, I think naturally is going to have more opportunity to play because I think he matches up with a wider range of player. So I think we're going to get to see a lot of him this year. And if he continues to do that, like, I, I don't know why he wouldn't start most games at least. Would you, would you think about like the matchup with, uh, we saw Josh Giddy and Franz what R- R- Ragna, <laughs> Vag- <laughs> however you say it, you guys, Vag- like, like I was watching in that fourth quarter, right? And every single time we're down, here's, you know, Josh Giddy matched up to a much bigger person. You know, Franz was doing a great job staying in front of Josh, but not doing a real good job of keeping him under control. It's interesting to me because on defense, Josh is having to play that same, you know, power forward type player. Yes, people say he's small forward body, but I think he's like a 6'10 player, you know? Um, fr- Franz? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we list him at like six, nine, I think, but with his athleticism, yeah, I was, I was really big on him in the draft process. I felt yeah. like he was more but than seeing just how Josh is matched up. I love that. Yeah. And, he, and he's very good player. He's, he's one of the best sophomores in the NBA right now and got to love what the magic are doing. Well, yes, but Shay has a little bit of a bone to pick potentially with this idea that they have the number one pick here with Paulo. We like mm. Paulo. Paulo's a good player. Got a ton of old Great man play. game. Perimeter orientated, six foot ten player can get downhill, finish all these different things. But was he actually the number one pick? What Shay say, Dave? Ah, uh, Shay said at the very end. He said of the interview, they're asking about Paulo and how good he is, and he's you know letting him know that he's he's good. But he says Chet Holgram was the number one pick, by the way. Wow. And it goes back to the other episode we talked about. You know, the NBA is trying to change things up, right? So that guys like Chet can't decide where they want to go. Because, I listen, after hearing more stories, like, Chet stopped his workout like three minutes or four minutes into his workout. It could have been, you know, 30 or 40 minutes into his workout, but it was scheduled all day. And he stopped and left early. So never gave his uh, medical stuff there. He picked where he wanted to go. And they want to cut that shit out. Now looking at it, like maybe maybe this was their idea was Chet was number one in their minds, but they they weren't going to pick somebody that didn't want to go there. 
Bro, I mean, you can you can say, oh, well, giving them the medical information would have been enough. But if he just quits a workout, then that's – I mean, you can't legislate that out of the league. I mean, John, did you you get much into the um, pre-draft as we were, like, zeroing in on Chet? Like, did you did you watch all that breakdown? I watched a lot of it, yeah. Uh, I was paying yeah. attention, and there was a lot – I mean, there's so much conversation about it, but it definitely seems like he chose the Thunder. Um, right. And, and his agent – you know, it seems to have had a heavy role in that. And I mean, I think at this stage in a player powerful league, like why not? Like right. it's going to be good. Well, I just feel like the magic probably feel good about it right now with Chet being injured, Paulo going out there and making his case for rookie of the year early. I mean, you like, I don't think there's anything wrong. I, I understand the NBA wants to like find a way around this and stuff, but in the end, like it's worked out for both parties. And well, I mean, we'll see. It could end up backfiring on the Thunder if Chet doesn't ever, you know, get on the court, right? There's, there's both sides to this, but I have a lot of confidence in his long-term future. It was good getting Getty back out there and playing. You know, like we, everybody talks about all oh, this losing, incentivized losing. Really, we're doing all this winning with with Giddy kind of in a reserve role because he's been injured. He hasn't been coming off the bench even, but then he comes back into the starting role. But at the same time, kind of like what you were saying at the beginning. Um, like with, with Shay, John, it was like, Hey, like you got to come out here and play at the pace the team picked up while you were out. Right. And and then he can match it. Like Giddy's feeling the same thing. Team goes on a winning run when he's out. He doesn't want to like drag it down, but yeah, but he is on minute restriction guys. There's no way that if, listen, he played 25 minutes with missing the last seven minutes of the game. Yeah. He didn't play that closing, unit. right? He would have had 32 minutes if that's the case. That's his normal minute time. So people can say, oh, well, we took Josh Giddy out and we're closing without Josh Giddy." No, he's on minute restriction for a couple of games. And that means that we are going to put him in the best place for him every single time to get him up to game speed. And that was where he was at. And that third end of the third quarter into that fourth quarter, that was where he needed to be. We went on a run. We came back from a deficit. It was perfect. And, and, and looking at it, I feel very honored that honored. I feel very good that, uh, uh, Coach D decided to do that with Josh Giddy because the reality is if we didn't have that moment, right, we would have been leaning on Shea this whole time to get us back. And instead, Shea gets less or uh, less minutes than he's gotten in all season in this game, and we still win. Yeah, I think – I feel like Coach is just working at a kind of a, an interesting angle. He's got 10, 11 guys that he could see them fitting on the court at any time. And – I, f- I sort of feel like Giddy and Shea are finding their their clicks still. Like they really, if you look back in the last two year and, and year and ten day, ten games or eight games, they haven't actually played together in a lot of games. Um, their their injuries have kind of staggered each other. Um, Giddy, when he was when he had his player the um, Western Conference Player of the Weeks back in the last year. Um, jo- uh, Shea was out like I I think that when you have two people who are such offensive kind of commanders um they need to learn how to like work their game together and when I see them on the court together right now I I do sense a slight bit of uh, awkwardness between them not in a bad way like they just like Shea's game is different than Josh's and but and and it's when you boil it down, it's not that different. It's just about getting them to mesh. And I, I don't think it's anything to be concerned with. Like I think that they're they've meshed personality wise. Now it's just about figuring out how to like kind of get that game to drive. Now they have great moments together. I'm not trying to knock that at all or anything like that. But I don't know. I I like this idea that Chris keeps talking about on our, our buddy on YouTube, talking about uh, you have this idea of. Josh Giddy being this bird type player. Yeah, he can run the offense. Yeah, he can take over like that. But having him more in this role of of, you know, off the ball essentially. And listen, Josh is always going to average close to 10 assists a game. Like he had 10 10 assists, 7 points. Double double if he gets the points there. Like yeah, that's I mean, the, that's, that's the, the case with him, right? That's what Josh will always do. It doesn't matter what position he plays because he understands the game, right? It's not an insult to Josh to move over a position, you know? It's just not because you're looking at what Shea can do and you're saying, okay, right? Shea's got to run. Shea's got to do his thing because he's proving he is a top 10 player in the NBA right now. 
the way he's playing. I'll find their mix when possessions can go from one yes. to the other. It'll just it'll just Being be patient. this possession. Shea runs it because he had the moment. It'll be this possession. Uh, Giddy takes it because he had the right moment. Like it's it's just a matter of getting it's just getting the teams the the, the possessions to balance out and figure out like who what the right choice is. But they're both learning so much about choices and and when to do what they need to do. So like there's a lot of confidence still and the system will allow them to develop all that together. Right. You throw in J dub as a third playmaker in that starting lineup. Dort has really transitioned into more of a playmaker than he has been. Although at this point, his game offensive game is more predicated on scoring than it is playmaking for everybody else. But that's going to come with, with the next progression as that's what you offered Dort though right now, because you want him taking that shot like he did last night when he said, he was big in that fourth quarter, right? Yeah. Like he shot it early and it wasn't falling, but as the game went on, he didn't stop. And then he knocked down, I think two threes that were just incredible as, but at least one right in front of the camera, like it was a straight line and you're just like watching it. Like, man, it couldn't be more beautiful than that. That angle was awesome. So he put up 14 points and we had JRE put up 11, five and two assists there for him. I mean, Great contributions from everybody who played. Oh, it was awesome. amazing, man. So the bench unit, we got some 16 points from Poku, nine rebounds, one assist. Um, I don't have his block shots in front of me. Three. Three. And once again, two steals. Like, it feels like it was more. Um, two steals, yeah, everywhere. You know, we'll take that for sure. It's it's big time minutes from Poku. He, he had been starting a little bit early. They kind of transitioned him out of that starting lineup. And then he earned the closing minutes this game. So big minutes from Poku. He had half of our offensive rebounds last night with four. Like what he did was crazy because their big lineup is truly is truly huge. And they had those guys out there a lot. And he was out there, you know, listen, the team rebounds, team steals, um, and team blocks are going to be up because of Poku. Because it only says he has three. Well, team blocks, we have way more than what we're saying. Team steals, the times that he would tip the ball, get a deflection or whatever, and somebody else would get a steal, whatever that, that case is. There's so much of this stuff right here that Poku did last night. And I can't help but just take a step back and start admiring what he can do. And I know everybody in Oklahoma City, as far as that is on or off the Poku train, listen, I get it. People don't quite know what to think about Poku. You don't know if he should be a center at 195, 200 pounds. Listen, he can. He will be. He needs to be because his defense is going to be legendary. All he's got to do is continue to play and doing what he's doing. He's 21 and have four, has four years in the NBA. Come on, guys. This young man is going to be something special. He just needs time to continue to develop. There's no time limit with Poku. And that's what's so great about Poku is that I'm gonna we're gonna continue to watch him grow because we're not gonna get rid of Poku. He's just too good and he's shown too much, especially to Mark and I, to sit sit back and say, This guy doesn't deserve a next contract. If you want to hear it from someone else, listen to Shea last night and his pre- post game presser. He said Poku's starting to find himself in the NBA. And I mean, like when you've got your your team captain coming up and saying that to the press, that's, that's a huge statement. But it's also it's also just something we've all been able to see. Like it's very clear there that he's he's taking a bit to find himself, but it's happening this year. And once he knows it, once he gets that confidence, everything changes. Yeah, and what would it say if he he didn't take time to come into the league and you know figure it out? Like he just came in and was that great right away? Like it would be quite different, you know. But it does take time and we've never been in a rush. There've been people who have been on the Poku wagon, jumped off the Poku wagon, Poku wagon, jumped back on it. Right. And then have already been thinking about jumping back off of it. And now they're already, they're st- I mean, it's crazy. And he's only 21 and you look at what he can do just to disrupt the other team, you know, as sh- you know, blocking shots, getting steals, deflections, offensive rebounds. And then you say he's an actual floor spacer you know, when he's at his best and things like that. Hey, he's a great slasher too. When he's moving and he can catch the ball and he, he's got good hands. Like that's one mm. thing that big men who move, a lot of times they, they have trouble catching the ball. He can catch it while he's moving, he can, you know, finish over people. And that's been great. Um, we also got some big, go ahead, Dave. Hey, what you real got? quickly, 
Real quickly, I was rolling on some things about Poku. Let's just address that right now. Uh, he was our 2020th, 2020 first round pick. So he's a, this is a third year in the league. Okay. And he's only 20. There, you go. there we go. I was Fixing off, guys. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about the youngest guy on the team, Usman Jang. Hmm. I thought big time for him to go from the G League assignment, which I don't know if he played any games, but I know he No, no games yet. They're coming up. All right, so he practiced with them, came back up, and was shooting the ball in rhythm. He looked really confident out there. It looked like um, like the, the type of thing you would expect from a player who you know went to an assignment to build their confidence, right? But at the same time, I'm like, how much could it have built his confidence? He didn't actually go do anything in that assignment, but somehow, I think, understanding how... Smaller, smaller guys, not NBA, necessarily ready guys, helps. Right. Right, and I think just like understanding that like this is a part of the flow of this team, right? Yeah. That helps. That helps, oh, yeah. and then you're like, okay, well, you know, this is it's consistency from the the Thunder to the Blue, and the same offense, the same defense, and you can find yourself doing well and and build your confidence. So I thought this was a good game for Jay. Absolutely, this is something to build off for him. I think it's the 17 minutes that he needed, uh, eight points in that 17 minutes, and really that was the first half. Uh, he just played really, really well. Um, I, I, you know, that's what he's going to have to do this season. When he gets the minutes, he's going to have to play well, and that's it, because that's the only way to earn minutes on this team. Yeah, and also I think a big thing to remember about the Blue is it's not even about the games they're playing because it's practice minutes. But I've heard a lot about in the NBA, you know, with all the games so regularly, they're not getting a lot of practice time. Maybe one one day a week they're actually in the gym practicing with the team. The rest of it's pregame, kind of running through stuff or different things like that. It's not just a, a standard practice. Um, and I imagine going down to the blue, it's the exact same system. It's the exact same concepts. Everything's running the same under the same kind of um, visual or vision. And he gets to go do a few practices at a high pace. I mean, the G, the G League's still professional athletes. These guys are still great players they might be a bit smaller they may not be as, as effective in the, in the practice but he's still going to get to play at that level and and see the system then he comes back and just falls right back in like i think i think at this stage it's just about getting repetition they all just need a lot of repetition and the g league is going to provide that even if it's not ever getting into a game yet yeah for sure and some of the guys we've seen you know take that step and then back and forth and then really move up it's been really fun and dort is that is that real big example that, you know, everybody, every organization can kind of build their, you know, their two-way contracts around. Um, so let's talk about Trey Mann. Um, big shots, big spots, earning closing minutes, finding ways to be impactful down the stretch. I did notice at different times, though, he looked like he was kind of trying to find a way to make an impact down the stretch. I think when... He's at his best. We're going to be shocked with what he's capable of to close out a game because he he's there. He's in these big moments. He's young enough to really be absorbing it. But <laughs> you see kind of like a young Shea in him, right? Like he's observe, observing, <coughs> absorbing it, but he's not really at that point where he can by his by himself go and change the trajectory of a game. Like he can do that sometimes, but he can't say, this is my game. I'm going to go do it anytime he wants, like Shea can. So I feel like him being around for this is really critical, similar to Shea for CP3. But hopefully we can have it all in one giant, you know, killer closing lineup in the future. But right now, Trey, he, he's killing it, man. 13 points, five rebounds, three assists, getting there at the right time. You know, getting sticking his nose in and creating deflections, and you know, if somebody brings the ball down, you know, going and getting that broccoli. Yeah, man, I I I like Trey Man a lot. I think that he's one of those players that, as he continues to transition into this this NBA uh, physique, body, whatever you want to call it, uh, he's going to get to that point where he's just going to be that J.R. Smith type player. You know, that Jordan Poole type player. Um, I already feel like he's better than Jordan Poole in so many things. So I don't know, man. I, I, I'm looking at Trey Mann as being that, that sixth man of the future for this team. And 
having somebody that can come in and drop, you know, 15 to 20 points in a game is exactly what you need. And one day he's going to have an opportunity to earn a starting position. And, you know, like right now, though, playing against the second units, he needs to dominate. He's got, I mean, he's got so many tools and so many weapons. I, he's, he's learning from a great one, how to control that and how to do that. Um, it's a bit cheesy, but like, it's kind of like a, a superhero in, in the movie or whatever. They have to learn how to access their powers. Like he's coming out, he's trying to figure out like, all right, I have this ability to sometimes impact this game in a heavy way. Like, you know, 15 points in, in a short time period. He's, he's done it before many times. And he's trying to figure out how to, like, spark that. But the thing this year that I saw, I've been seeing versus last year, is when he's feeling that, he doesn't force it. He doesn't force his impact on the game. Last year, I felt like he started trying to really force his impact on the game. And, you know, in the end, it just didn't doesn't work. You can't, you can't do that in the NBA and, and, and within an offense that depends so much on the, the functionality of every, every part. So I think this year, even like last night, he wasn't really ever like a standout, but he always, when, when he did hit shots, they were the shots that were needed. He, when he did make plays, they were the play that was needed in that moment. And it worked out to where he hit 15 without even really being like, you know, one of his kind of top moments um, going, you know, dropping 15 in a short time period or whatever. So I, I think it's really interesting to see, but I'm happy to see that even on like what I might call like a slower night for him, he's able to put up 15 with, um, you know, a longer stat line than just points too. You know, I want to say this about his, his shot real quickly, Mark, is um, I have yet to see a second year player with a better crossover step back than him. I mean, You'd have to go back to Allen Iverson, maybe a Kobe, something like that to to bring up a player that has a, a a shot like that that's so filthy early in their career. And that's why I I can't say enough about him is that when he starts figuring out how to do it, and listen, Allen Iverson came down and everybody knew what Allen Iverson was going to do. And nobody could stop him. Even at 6'3", it didn't matter. Nobody could stop him. That's exactly what Trey Mann does. Everybody knows he's going to come down and do a crossover step back, right? It's a matter of time before he puts it together and puts a couple games of 40-plus points a game. I'm telling you, this guy, he's hes a different breed. He's hes something that's, that's so incredibly amazing to have on your team that you can't even describe it. Like, one day, when he goes out there and he puts on a show in a game seven or a game six or whatever, everybody's just going to stop and be like, Oh, okay. You know, that's why that's why LeBron needed to have somebody like, you know, um I said his name a little bit ago. I can't even think of his name now. Um, I'm thinking Kyrie. I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah, no, I was thinking um uh J.R. Smith. Right. You know, like a shooter to come out there and just dominate one game or two games so that he doesn't have to. You know, Shea's gonna need that type of, of a player. He's gonna need that type of of you know, I, I called it a breed, but it's that, that type of instinct you know, in you to be able to come out and do something like that. And if you look at our bench, even our team, there's very few guys that have that ability, and Trey Mann does. Isn't that Appreciate kind of what, what Coach and Presti are doing, like, in the end? They're building a team full of players that have the ability within their own game to have huge impacts. Like, and I think that may be why we're not setting a, a rotation super heavy and we're not really seeing a – a set starting lineup because I think, you know, matchups, NBA is matchup heavy. Like you, you, you'll see games where a not so good team will compete just because their matchups worked. Like, and I mean, even like last night when we were playing poorly, it was because their matchups were better than like, they outmatched us in a lot of areas if we didn't play a specific style of basketball. So like, I feel like um, in that sense, when we, when we go in and, change out the lineup it's really just about trying to play those matchups and say who on our team is going to fit this matchup role a bit better and um, yeah so how much longer do you think we can keep this winning streak going i mean four get four games is more than we thought we would hit when we started this streak we were like hey let's get one win now we're at four what do you guys think what's what's the next phase for this team we're already feeling pretty lucky well Let's go back to what we talked about in uh, preseason when we said 
first 10 games, where do we, where are we going to stand? You know, I think we were yeah. like six and four, seven accept? and three, six and four, seven and three, something like that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this is one of the situations for me where I'm like hoping to get, say 500. Yeah. And, and I think that's the situation that we're it's in is that schedule. there's a, we had a, we're having one of the hardest schedules, the hardest schedule in the NBA the first 10 games. And we're four and three. Like, so, but we have Denver next and then Milwaukee after that. Like, how, so, how are you feeling against Denver? I mean, we played them well last time, but we couldn't get it done. You feel like we got a, a win in us here? We're different. The last this. two years, we've, we've matched up well with Denver. We give, we give our defensive our system the way we run our defense give gives joker problems um i actually think that denver's a, a win for, it can be a win for us i mean the thing with denver is we can't afford to get down by a major amount and expect to come back on them because they're a bit more seasoned team and they have defensive threats in a lot of ways like i agree but, i mean i feel like the tendency to get into deficits is going to hurt us against denver it is, but we can we can out, we can outmatch them and we can outplay them. I've, we've seen it done. We've just we've just got to do it again. I I think the four quarters. The first game that we played them, I, I think it was the lack of bench they used that I, I I watched. Like that's the thing. If they go and they don't have a bench again, and they're only going seven or eight deep because they're going for the W and they don't want to use anybody else, then yeah, we've got more of a chance because we just wear people down. Our fast pace up and down the court, you know, our defense is is really physical. We wear people down. So that's the thing about it is that we went 11 deep last night, and that's with Isaiah Joe going only two minutes, so really 10 deep. Um, that's what we're going to do against teams. We're going to go and go at teams' throats and just go, 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 go. And seeing that and knowing that, and we have 10 players, 12 players that can play every single night, and pit in big minutes, a lot of teams are going to have a hard time with that. No so doubt. We play one. our game. When our game is so different, right? Like, you keep watching, and it's like this way we approach attacking the basket, getting downhill, and, okay, we're known to shoot a lot of threes. That's not like giving anybody anything that they shoot, don't know. Shoot a ton of threes. All right, but what is... Working for us right now is the slashing behind the cutters. I mean, behind the drivers. Like, get cutting, backdoor cuts, you know, delay cuts. Um, I don't know, you know what it's called where somebody follows the ball, you know, and they cut right behind the ball after the drive has been because there's still kind of like the parting of the Red Sea. Like, there's all these cuts that we're making. And then on top of that, the passes to the cutter are kind of like a, a great quarterback and wide receiver where only the cutter can receive the ball. And we're seeing these happen like on a regular basis where like we're spraying the ball around the court, we're cutting at a high level, and then we're like the passes are connecting and it's all working together. And I keep coming away being like, well, it doesn't matter who we're playing. Like I'm sure that they can increase the defense, but if we play our way, if we play our skill level, then we're going to play well. Some teams will force us into mistakes. They'll put good zone defenses, give us you know something different to look at. But in the end, we play our way, and it's you can tell that it's our way because it's so consistent no matter who we're playing, and then you kind of get to this point where, like, this must be how we practice. You know what? We practice at this high intensity, and we'll call it organized chaos almost. Is If you're watching it, like the defense, like how do you stop the second and third or fourth or fifth you know, actions on we, our offense. We, our, our offense is designed to go at the weaknesses right. because we attack every single angle, every single time. You know, like the second we get an angle that's open, whether that's wide open three or Shea going to the middle or Dort going for a layup, like it's all about matchups and they just keep on switching and keep on going. And, and we go so fast that sometimes it's like we go through the offense almost, you know, five or six times in that 24 second shot clock. It's insanity, and I love it because everybody's moving, and and everybody crashes the board. Yeah, did you guys know we have we shoot the most field goals per game currently in the NBA? Really? Yeah, uh, obviously don't have the highest percentages, but that to me is something to say. Like, yeah, we're we're taking a lot of shots, and when we start hitting more of these shots, 
the things are going to change elsewhere. We, but we're getting, we're not shooting bad shots despite shooting more shots than anybody in the NBA. I don't see a lot of bad shots. And to me, that says that we're getting the most, we're, out, we're capitalizing and, and making the most out of every possession. We're getting shots on almost every time we touch the ball and we're not giving the ball up. Like we're doing, that's one of the most important parts of offense. Every one of these guys can score the basketball. That's why they're on the court and that's why they're in the NBA. Like they can score the basketball. They just have to get the offense to allow them to get the shots they're supposed to take. And we're doing that. Like, Hell yeah, we're doing it. Bro, it's it's a beautiful thing to watch because nobody's expecting it from us right now. So we're watching the maturity, the evolution of this team happen in real time. I love it when you occasionally catch a, a glimpse of Sam Presti standing in the tunnel watching the team. Like, I don't know if you guys, I, of course you don't remember this exact game, but when um, Tommy Griffin would be there watching Taylor and Blake Griffin, you know, and he would not be their coach before he you know started coaching them at OCS. He would just kind of stand there and have this presence in the game where it was like, you know, I got your back. And yeah, exactly. There you go, Dave, crossing the, shoulder, um, the arms and just standing there. I, I feel like Presti has that same presence of a, of a proud papa who says, this is, this is my team. And he's watching these players come into their own and he's assessing it a lot like we are, except not because he's different. Yeah, dude. It was it was always intimidating watching Tommy Griffin walk into a, a uh, gym. He always knew all the refs. He always knew all the coaches if they were a good team, um, you know. And everybody knew who uh, Taylor and Blake were when you were playing against them, uh, just because of his legendary status from uh, John Marshall um, High School in Oklahoma City. There, um, so again, to me, it's 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 really interesting watching this team though as we're putting things together. And, and that's exactly what we're doing. Like, this is not a consistently, you know, 48 minutes of putting things together. It's 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 choppy right now, you know? Like, it's getting there, but it's still choppy. And I think that's the great thing about it is that when you listen to Coach D talk, he's like, yeah, we got the win. There's some things we need to work on, blah, 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 blah. He's right because he sees the bigger picture. He sees the bigger picture that we were 10 for 34 on three-pointers, you know? He sees that we shot 47.4% uh, from the field goal, 45 for 95. Like, he sees these things, and he wants to get these better. You know, he sees the misses, uh, the times that we gave him offensive rebounds, which are 12, and he doesn't like giving up offensive rebounds. He loves it when we're the best team out there uh, on the offensive boards, and we got crushed last night. And that's what those are the things that I look at, and I see that Coach D, he knows, and he's going to be out there expecting more and that's what we have with this team is we have a coach that sees the future with them that knows how good we can be and he's growing as this team grows and it's a really powerful combination of just guys playing for coach and coach coaching for the guys and it's not like coaches out there yelling um, run this play run that play do this do that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing the only guys that are getting yelled at or anything like that are the ones that aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's what's so great. You know, once in a while, she say, tells one of the young guys to do that. And, oh, man, my bad. You know, like, listen, everybody knows what's going on. They know what they're supposed to, where they're supposed to go, what they're supposed to do. And Coach D is a no-nonsense coach. And he's young. And I love it. Full scale buy in. Everyone, everybody on the team is bought into the organization, bought in every part of it. Every you part. You can see it. It makes a huge difference. And you see players like JRE come in and understand their role so fast. It's because they're defined and they can then move into bigger roles. And, you know, we see players like Kenny Hustle not get out there and get any minutes. And that also is part of it, too. And it's matchups game situations, whatever. Obviously, every player who has a jersey on wants to be out there playing, and they should. But got to trust your coaches. Got to recognize it's all process. Something about John's audio has gone kaput, so we're going to have to figure out that. But it's all good. We're having a good time. Obviously, everything going on, four games in a row, bro. 
Like, we got to think of something better than tic-tac-toe. I mean, what is four in a row? You got anything, bro? Um, Nice. Right up, Look on your feet like that. That's why, Jesus. I, that's why you're um, good at this. Yeah, there we go. Jesus did something four in a row. Four in a row. I don't know. He did something four in a row. No, nah, I, I doubt it. Jesus was a three-day guy. But oh, dang it. We got John back. Yes. A little bit. You there, bro? Not really. Kind of funky. We're getting there. We're getting there. Bro, you got anything else to add about the Thunder game? You want to... We got some other stuff to talk about, too. Man, um, I was just thinking... Uh, uh, what was the final score? 116 to 108? 109? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Bro, when Wendell you ask Carter, like, absolute questions like that, and we don't have the stuff, it's... All right, 108 to 116. There you go. There you go. Now Wendell we know. Carter had a great game, I thought. And, um, yeah, Apollo got shut down, so it felt good. What about, yeah, we, I mean, we should talk more about Baisley, but I, I mean, like, I thought he played some good minutes, but we'll, we'll talk more about, we got, we got a lot of talk to go with Baisley, bro. I'm, I'm still a believer. I'm not well, willing to give that up yet. And I, I love feel Baisley. Like, yeah, I mean, I feel like he plays big enough, like, in the little moments for us. And no doubt. We, he'll have big games when he needs it. All right, so I already mentioned my top story, which is Dr. Oz's, um, his research director declined his request to deny that his studies killed puppies. There we go, bro. Bro, right. I, don't, I don't even know what to say except, like... You don't care? I mean, it's kind of like people saying, like, her, herpes never killed anybody. AIDS never killed anybody. You know? Right. Like... Everybody knows that Dr. Oz is guilty. <laughs> All right. There we go. The puppy murderer has been convicted in the court <laughs> of public opinion. All right. So let's jump around since we're doing this court of public opinion stuff. All right. We recently, I'll say broke it because I don't see anybody else breaking the news, but broke the news that the Boston Celtics head coach, Emma Odoka, had an affair Allegedly, we don't know for sure, but with one of the minority owners of the Celtics' wife. All right, so there we go. First thing. Second thing. Steve Nash has been fired by the Nets. Yeah, yeah. Third thing. The Nets need a coach. Is it Udoka? Is that it? Oh, oh yeah. I, I told you this was going to happen, man. I, like, I, I told you that... He was going to be suspended from the team. And as more information came out, people were going to be like, we don't want him back here. Right? Right. Right. And another team was going to be able to come up and offer a second round pick or something like that for him. Man. And, you know, go that way. And they would take it. But it sounds like what's going on is that they asked the Celtics and the Celtics are like, yeah, take him. We don't want him. And I think they're going with that, man. And it's kind of weird to me. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I think about at this moment, except for, like, just say it, bro. You want you want Josh Primo over there? Yeah, man. I want to go. <laughs> I want Josh Primo to go there and and have a mentorship program. How how to proper how to properly expose yourself? Yeah, man. Hey, only to your boss's uh, wife. <laughs> man that could be that could be something there Um, I I do think that Steve Nash being fired was obvious we were talking about like him calling up the team's effort which after your star player you know asked that you get fired that's pretty much your final straw there so Nash is back jobless I'm sure he'll be fine Um, but this wasn't the right spot for him Udoka can basically he has everything to gain and nothing to lose from getting out of out of that suspension so i'm hoping for him man crazy crazy how the coaching carousel has taken um you know a little detour off ramp back on the ramp and here we go he only missed what 10 games how about that (laughs) like 
crazy. We'll see. We'll see how it all breaks down. But it seems like that's where everything is going. And if you're the Nets, the sooner the better, as as this type of stuff goes. Um, of course, they have to do their due diligence. But I mean, if they already know the bad stuff, then what more do you need to do? I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. But if I'm if I'm the Nets, I I mean, you have to start clearing your deck because. You know, like you, you don't have any more options. Like Kyrie's going to walk. He's made that clear. Yeah. My suggestion is just don't have like the minority owner's wife do booking of the trips. Yeah. That could be a protect you a little bit. Or, or don't have your owner's wives, wives, Pearl, some places you never know, never know. Um, come to, to the events. <laughs> Shout out Salt Lake City. Shout out Will Hardy. <laughs> Shout out Boston Celtics for giving away Will Hardy right before they were going to promote him into the position. I know. That was supposed to be his. But now Dude. he's with Danny Ainge out and killing it. SLC, man. Killing it. Good for him. Good for them. Speaking of killing it, bro, we got Justin Verlander. Drop deuces, man. I love it, man. Flipping off Phillies fans before game three. How about that, bro? What, what, what do you vicious. think? Is there anything better? It's It was a vicious crowd in Philly. Uh, I've seen so many videos of the Philly fans just going at these pitchers. Listen, if I'm a pitcher, I don't want to be anywhere near Philly right now. You know, like, I'm happy with just winning as many games in my home stadium as possible. But now, in order to win the, the championship, now you're going to have to win, you know, a couple more, if not three in Philly, you know, like that's, that's not good. Justin Verlander. We appreciate your bird though. That's going to be the most memorable thing that the Astros do this world series. You can't, you can't really hide any stick and stuff, giving people the birds. So no, no, nah, dude, I'm going to be going down to Philly actually a few days. So no trash That'd cans there to bang. They don't believe in trash cans. In Philly. <laughs> Bang anything, but not a trash can. Uh, all right. So, um, this is one of the best stories of the year. Stanford has suspended their tree mascot because it opened a sign, a banner at halftime that said, Stanford hates fun. So, to confirm that theory, Stanford went ahead and Suspended the mascot. <laughs> wow. I think that he just capitalized his statement on that one. Yeah. In one swift move. Yeah. Like, we'll show you how unfun we are, young man. You're going to get no mascot at the game. Everybody loses. Yeah. Now you can't be on the field anymore. What's up with that? Like, and Are they suspending the mascot or the person the behind person. the mascot? The person. Are you sure? Has to be, bro. I know, but what if they actually said, like, we don't even need a tree? The tree of knowledge, bro. bro. You Dude, need what other the tree sports, of knowledge. I mean, I guess it's a tree. Like, It's not like you're going to, like, suspend the dog mascot. I mean, even OU, right? Their little Sooner Schooner flipped over, yeah. almost killed somebody. Yeah. They don't get suspended. They're just like, uh, put those wheels on right. Jesus, man. Um, <laughs> nothing you can almost die, but as long as you don't say anything bad against administration, you're fine. You say something bad against administration. Oh shit. Shut that shit down. It's probably because a, a party was canceled and they're all pissed off about it. There's there, it's probably been a, a, a series of things they've done <laughs> that take away all the fun for everybody. And all right. So I got one here, dude, a kayaker rescued after surviving two days hanging on to a buoy and rough seas, eating seaweed and crabs. Now, Only two days? Two days. Here's my theory, right? He wasn't that hungry since it was only two days. He yeah, could have been starving to death, right? Yeah, I could. It's man. just that he was like, dude, free sushi. Yeah. Like, that's like, that's a preference, man. Crabs, mussels, seaweed. I don't know what he's complaining about, let's be honest. I mean, he was in pretty bad shape when they rescued him. He couldn't talk and stuff like that. But still, I mean, he had good sushi anyway. What? Dude, what is this world made of if you can't talk after two days of hanging out to a buoy? 
I mean, could you imagine being immersed in salt water for two days, dude? You'd be so pruny, you wouldn't even be a pucker. Oh, man. You do pucker it up already. Up. You bring a good point up. Anyway. All right. So, hard, hard turn here. We got we got a sad story to talk about. Oh, man. Takeoff from the Migos. Yeah, shot in Houston, bro. And 28 years old, man. That's, I mean. There's a like, game of dice they're saying. Yeah. Fuck that. Yeah, I mean, so it's like hard because it's like, what do you say? You know what I mean? To the kids, you like talk to them. You're like, dude, this shit is still happening. And it's like, there's not a lot to say. So there's no, there's no jokes with this one. This is just like the reality of the world we live in. Unfortunately, like no amount of money that you make or how successful you are can completely escape you from gun violence. And like, you see like, no. yeah, man, as yeah it just keeps happening right and i don't know man like nipsey hustle that was you know that was something that as fans of the thunder fans of russell westbrook you know we saw that like completely affect him him go get that 2020 game and then just stop be like that's that's for you nipsey and here we yep. are this is another you know rapper who's intricately tied to the nba like yep. the atlanta hawks trey young they like the migos are like they're there for every game it feels like i thought oh, they are. i don't know man i don't watch the hawks but I, you know if it's on tnt and i'm watching it it's like you're always seeing quavo you're always seeing these guys and i just it sucks man like you said a, a game of dice at a bowling alley 230 and a life is gone man it's it's unnecessary it's unneeded I, it's just it's just gun violence, period. I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that are um, from different countries, and you know they'll say have their opinion on it. But to me, like this is this is exactly what's sad is that you're having people have violence, and it doesn't matter if it's a gun, it doesn't matter if it's a knife, it doesn't matter if it's you know uh, a bat. I mean, violence is violence, and that's what's sad is that these guys uh, that are that are dying from violence. And, and we saw yesterday, 14, um, people, uh, were killed in, um, Chicago, um, because of gun violence. So, and that was yesterday. So gun violence is, is, is truly something that's not a, a good situation right now. And it's, it's not a safe place for, uh, people out there sometimes. And, you know, we live in Washington, DC and, um, it's one of those things where you're, you're coherent of everything that's happening. And and we've lived in a place called Newburgh, New York. And if anybody knows anything about Newburgh, New York, it's, it's one of the, uh, capitals, um, a murder, um, in America. And, uh, it's, it's, it's just one of those things that it's sad and it's something that a lot of people, and especially now that are starting to talk about it, you know, we need to be able to talk about it and put it out there that we don't agree with the way that guns are being used and utilized. And um, that's that. Yeah, that is that, man. Like, usually we try to have a lot of fun. And obviously, you know, getting a win is, is a lot of fun. But for this podcast, bro, I think we're just going to leave it right there and call it a day, bro. And we will be back. Our goal is to have an episode up Thursday night or yeah. Friday morning, depending on how things shake down. I'm going to be headed into New York City for the day to see my niece and... See what's going up, going on in the Empire City. So we'll we'll be back and we'll have more fun. We promise. Sorry to end such on such a downer, but I mean, like, there's really nothing it's else news, to say, baby. Man. Yeah. So we appreciate you guys, and, and we'll see you guys soon.